Hello everyone and welcome to Southridge. If this is your first time joining us in this format, we want to offer a few tips on how to make the most of this experience. Be sure to crank up the volume during the music and sing along. Don't worry, we can't hear you. Musicians, download the music charts below the video, grab your instrument and play along. For any kids participating with us, don't worry if you don't know the words or can't read the words, just sing, dance or make music of your own. We're so happy when you join us. If English isn't your first language or you experience hearing challenges, we encourage you to turn on the closed captioning on this video or download the transcripts for this morning's message. And be sure to download the Southridge app. This is the best way to stay connected and informed about everything that's going on here at Southridge. It's completely free and super easy to use. But for the next hour, I invite you to engage with this experience just as you were with us, surrounded by a community of diverse, curious, open-minded and inclusive people all desiring to tap into the power and presence of God together as we worship, pray, listen, laugh, and grow. There might be some things today that we do or say that really resonate with you, and that's great. There might also be things that stretch and challenge you, and we think that's good too. Ultimately, we encourage you to engage openly, thoughtfully, honestly, and wholeheartedly, trusting that the God we're here to connect with is a God who, above all else, is love. So, as we begin our time together, wherever and whenever you are, whether this is your first time with us or you've been around forever, we hope that for the next hour you feel like you're among friends. Welcome to Southridge. We're glad you're here.
won't He won't He won't fail He won't fail was built on you and I'm safe with you cause I'm gonna make it through rain came wind blew but my house was built on you I'm safe Even if you're new to faith or the Bible, you may have heard of the prodigal son. It's a story about a child who squanders their father's fortune only to eventually return home and be met with open arms, a generous welcome home party, and the undiminished love of the father. It's meant as a picture of just how lavishly and generously God loves each one of us. That's what the word prodigal means, to spend lavishly, extravagance bordering on wastefulness. This extreme language is meant as a double meaning in the story, describing both how the child squandered their father's fortune and how the father, lavishly bordering on wastefully, loved his child. There is nothing careful, measured, or efficient about God's love for us. God throws caution to the wind without a care for reputation or rejection. God's love risks everything, with no guarantee that we will return that love, loving freely, generously, extravagantly, bordering on wastefully. Have you ever experienced God's prodigal love in your life? I invite you to pause for a moment and consider as 1 John 3, 1 says, consider the kind of extravagant love the Father has lavished on us.
thing about love is, it inspires a response. First John goes on to say that because of how we've experienced God's prodigal love, we ought to also offer this kind of love to God and each other in return. Having reflected on how well you've been loved by God, take a moment and consider the way you love, the way you love God, the way you love the people in your life. Are you careful or calculating because you've been hurt? Do you only love fairly, only if and as much as someone else loves you? Or is your love over the top, generous, extravagant, bordering on wasteful? Take a moment and consider the way in which you show love to God by how you show love to others. Now, let's sing this song together as an act of letting God's prodigal love fill our hearts and to let it inspire us to respond with prodigal love and worship in return. Lord, you spent yourself in a wasteful way on your children, pouring out your life. You gave everything for your children. You are worthy of my worship and loyalty. I will spend my life. Oh, 
Glad you're here. <laughs> that sounded really weird. <laughs> you need to take a good look too, because you ain't never gonna see another one like me. <laughs> we invite you. Nope. You forgot the whole line that you made. The whole line. <laughs> we are a diverse community of imperfect people who see the church as less of something to go to and more of a life to be lived and shared with others. We are continually growing in what it means to love one another, fighting for unity rather than fighting over unnecessary arguments. We are living to serve this world in the way of Jesus, serving those in need and those on the margins, knowing that friendship truly makes the difference. So if you're coming with questions or curiosities, hurts or frustrations, joys or celebrations, wondering if the church can bring clarity or hope, or simply be a place to belong. We invite you to be at home with us. We invite you to explore with us. We invite you to grow with us. And we invite you to belong with us. Welcome to Southridge. We're glad you're here. Hey there, my name is Jessica Reimer and I serve as the Director of Connection here at Southridge. We're so glad that you're participating with us and we hope that this has already been a meaningful time for you. So I'm here in our St. Catharines location and if you've never joined us for one of our in-person gatherings at one of our physical Southridge locations, we would love to have you consider joining us in person when you feel ready and able. While we're so grateful to have this online platform, to share in this experience from wherever and whenever we find ourselves, we love it even more when we can gather together as a community. In fact, if you do come out, please come say hi to me or one of our many welcoming volunteers, and we'd love to get a small gift into your hands, just as a way of showing our appreciation for taking the time to come and meet us in person. And as even more of an incentive, we actually have monthly welcome lunches for anyone who's looking to learn more about our community and wanting to connect with some folks over some delicious food. So just check out our events page on the website to see when an upcoming welcome lunch is happening and we'd love to meet you there. If for whatever reason you're not able to or not comfortable with joining us in person, please know that actually doesn't in any way exclude you from participating in community with us. 
If you need to touch base with a pastor for any reason, please simply fill out one of our Connect cards. We can't wait to hear from you. For those of us who call this community home, one of the ways we practice togetherness and express our gratitude to God and generosity to others is by regular financial contributions. This is one of the ways we can invest our lives in what God is doing in and through our church family, making a difference by meeting needs among us, across our region, and around the world. All of our online given op giving options are available on our website, and so if you're able to give this week, we invite you to do so in a spirit of joy and generosity, and we thank you in advance for your faithfulness. So that's it from me. Now we're going to hear this week's talk together. And as we do, I invite you to remove as many distractions as possible and listen in to what God might want to be saying uniquely to you. Well, by show of hands, I have a question for you that's not rhetorical. I think you could actually, you could raise your hand for this one where we are. By show of hands... How many of us would say we've ever felt afraid of the dark? Like you can, you can raise your hand, you can look around, see that you're, you're not the only one. How many of us have felt afraid of the dark? And uh, for anyone not raising their hand this morning, uh, how many of us are struggling with honesty, right? I mean, being afraid of the dark, it is a, such a common human experience. But have you ever noticed that in those moments of kind of the shudder of fear that darkness can create, I don't think it's actually the darkness that we're, we're most afraid of. I think it's actually what darkness means, right? Like what darkness does, how it, it limits our visibility. It, it makes it hard to see kind of what might be out there. It makes us uh, afraid of what might be in the dark or, or how lost and disoriented uh, we could be or become because of the dark. I think that's way more of what's at the heart of that common experience of being afraid of the dark. And uh, if you've ever had that feeling, any of us that put up our hands, I think you're going to relate to some of the characters of our story today as we continue our series called Knowing God by Name. If you've been tracking with us the last couple of weeks, you know that we're on a journey of getting to know the most uh, prominent and profound name of the God revealed in the Bible, this, this name I am. And you know that our journey is uh, leading us right to Jesus, who also used this name for himself in a variety of ways. Last week, we looked at Jesus's uh, claim or declaration that he said, I am the bread of life. And so today we're going to continue on the journey of getting to know the God revealed in Jesus by name through the story of Jesus as told in the Gospel of John. That's where these I am statements all come from. Um, but like the first two weeks of the series, um, the story and name of Jesus that we want to zoom in on today, um, it actually began long before the time of Jesus. Actually, thousands of years earlier through the story of the exodus of the ancient people of Israel. So that's going to give us some of the context for the name, the I am, we're going to look at today. Now, two weeks ago, on the first week of the series, Tom Lowen uh, recounted the story of Moses meeting God through the mystery of a burning bush, a, a bush that was on fire but wasn't consumed. And this is where God first shared his name with Moses, the name that he wanted Moses to share with the people, that he is the God known as I am, and that I am wanted to free his people from slavery in Egypt. Well, now, fast forward through uh, the movies, The Ten Commandments, or The Prince of Egypt, you know, if you've seen either of those, where we saw that I Am worked miraculous wonders to release Israel from slavery and then start them on their journey to the promised land. However, if you are familiar with these stories, you know that shortly after Israel found themselves freed from slavery, you know, on the other side of the Red Sea, through the miraculous parting of the Red Sea, they quickly discovered that they were lost, that they were seemingly alone. And especially at night, they were consumed by the darkness and disorientation of the wilderness. That is until I am once again revealed his presence through the power of fire. Look at what we read in Exodus 13, 
verses 20 to 22, where it says, after leaving Sukkoth, uh, that means shelter. It was the name they gave to this place where they had camped out. After leaving Sukkoth, they camped at Etham on the edge of the desert. By day, Yahweh, I am, went ahead of them in a pillar of cloud to guide them on their way. And then listen to this, by night, in a pillar of fire to give them light so that they could travel by day or night. Neither the pillar of cloud by day nor the pillar of fire by night left its place in front of the people. Friends, in the the midst of the wilderness, this pillar of fire became the symbol of I am's presence with the people. And it became their literal guiding light through the darkness of the wilderness. And then thousands of years later, now now coming to the time of Jesus, uh, the people of Israel, every year, they still remembered and celebrated God's presence and provision through this time in the wilderness through uh, what they called the Festival of Shelters. Um, This was a massive festival that the the people of Israel celebrated uh, every year um, in the fall at harvest time. And, you know, crowds of of people, so many Jewish people, they would travel to the city of Jerusalem for this seven-day festival. But what what was interesting about this festival is that for the festival, they wouldn't actually stay in the city overnight. Many of the celebrations took place in the city. But uh, throughout the seven days, they would actually camp out on the outskirts of the city in in shelters. I have a sort of an artistic picture here of these wilderness-like shelters they would create to stay in throughout the festival, all as a way to remember that God provided for their ancestors through their 40-year camp out in the wilderness. And uh, this festival, this festival of shelters, it was quite a party. Um, Locally, you could think sort of grape and wine, but imagine that uh, everyone uh, coming to the festival camps out you know, night after night in Montebello Park, you know, imagine how that would take the party to another level. And to kick the whole thing off, um, the Festival of Shelters began with what's called the torchlight ceremony. This is a bit of what we see here. This was a ceremony in the women's court of the temple where on the first night of the festival, at dark, uh, four large candelabras, you can see one depicted here, they would be lit up with fire. A fire that was said to to light up all the courtyards in Jerusalem. All as a symbol of I am's pillar of fire that led the people through the wilderness. And kind of after the illumination ceremony had taken place, there was this all-night dance party in the temple. um, All to set the tone for the seven-day party of cascades of these shelters, all lit up by torches, night after night after night. Friends, this party was lit, quite literally. And when we read that Jesus was actually late in getting to the party, um, Jesus was about to make the claim of the party. A claim that would change the way people could know God by name forever. Now, the context for this claim is actually uh, spans three chapters in the Gospel of John, chapter 7 to 9, which you can read this week if you're, if you're interested. But I'll read a couple of verses from chapter 7 just to give us some context and then get to uh, John 8, verse 12, where we hear this claim. First in John 7, 14, it says, Not until halfway through the festival did Jesus go up to the temple courts and begin to teach. It wasn't until, you know, a number of days in that Jesus kind of came on the scene and began teaching in these temple courts. And then later we read in verse 37, it says, On the last and greatest day of the festival, This sort of sets up some more discourse and conversation from Jesus, ultimately that arrives at John 8, verse 12, where it says, When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. On the greatest day of the festival, you know, in the middle of the crowd, right in the very courts where this torchlight ceremony had taken place to kind of set the stage for the the whole festival of shelters, Jesus stands up and he says, I am the light of the world. 
And he says that whoever follows me as their light, they will never, never, not just at night, but never walk in darkness. He says, but they will have the light. What kind of light? The light of life. Friends, to Jesus' original audience, um, this would have been a shocking and upending claim to everything they had just spent a week remembering and celebrating. First, that Jesus, you know, as throughout this series, intentionally used this phrase, I am, to link himself with the name of God revealed in the, the burning bush to Moses and who was experienced powerfully through the pillar of fire. But then for Jesus to declare, to declare that, that he, he is in fact the light of the world that lights up all of the darkness of life. You know, it created so much controversy. And you can read about the controversy that surrounds Jesus' claim in those chapters, in, in chapters 7 to 9. Um, but amidst the controversy, for some, it sparked hope. Because although the people... Um, had celebrated how I am, had, had lit up the darkness of the past, so many once again found themselves lost and disoriented and afraid in the darkness of their present. You see, Israel, Israel was a people in Jesus' day um, who were politically oppressed under Roman rule. Um, not that different from where the whole story started in their slavery in Egypt. And many of the people felt uh, spiritually condemned by self-righteous religious leaders under the heaviness of what was to be the light of the law that they couldn't live up to that had been laid on them. You know, these power dynamics, they created socioeconomic challenges with many often struggling through famine and poverty and illness and then expulsion from the very people of faith that apparently knew and were to represent the light. And then they heard Jesus say, I am the light of the world. That the light isn't some distant, ancient, long lost pillar that the light isn't the, the sacred candles or fires in the temple that really seem to sort of guard or somehow restrict God's presence. That the light isn't the law or the teachers of the law, you know, even if they were to be a lamp unto the people's feet. No, Jesus said, I am. I am the God you're celebrating. I am the pillar of fire. I am the presence in the temple. I am the word of God that can be a lamp to your feet. I am the light in your darkness. Because I am the light of the world. Friends, this is the, the name of God we can know through Jesus today. That Jesus is... Um, the light of the world, the light of God and the light to God. The light that shines in the darkness and can set us free from all of our fear and disorientation. The light that can bring all of life into focus. So in wanting to get to know this God, this Jesus, this light, um, I want to ask you, where these days do you feel like you're lost in the dark? Where do you feel like you're wandering around in the wilderness? Where do you feel like you just can't see what's ahead of you or, or where you should go? Where do you feel disoriented? Where do you feel afraid? What decision are you facing that has no clear answer? What relationship seems stuck without a next step? What doubt has you paralyzed from everything you thought you once knew? Or what diagnosis or prognosis or recent loss just has you wondering whether there, there actually is a light of hope at the end of the tunnel? Friends, the good news today is that the God we long to know by name does in fact have a name. It's Jesus. And that Jesus is the light of the world, the light of God and the light to God that lights up the darkness. Jesus, the light who stands above and brighter um, than any other light we may want to follow. 
And I think at times in the midst of our, our darkness or, or our wandering, we actually look to other lights to want to be the true light or guide of our lives. I was reflecting on, on some of those this week. And uh, I mean, I'll, I'll say these first ones gently, you know, in, in our context. But I think because of what we see in Jesus, we need to know um, that the capital L light is not the Bible. And the capital L light uh, is not the church, although both are intended to be reflectors of the light. The capital L light is not religion. The light is not, you know, the sinner's prayer, if you've heard that faith formula. The light is not good theology, not family values, not meditation, not yoga, or five tips to a happy life. The light is not the media, surprise, surprise, whether mainstream or social. The light is not politics, not liberal or conservative or your favorite alternative. The light is not the right job, the right partner, the right paycheck or the right therapist, not the right family, not your parents, not your friends, not the right Enneagram type, not the latest book you're reading, not your favorite podcast, not substances, not technology, not science, not the gym, not education, and not whatever else along these lines we may want to look to as the light of our lives. No, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. That, that he is the light up of the world that can light up all darkness. So we never have to walk in darkness. The light that shines to show us who God really is and how we can follow and walk in his light. And so if you long to know and follow the light of Jesus more in your own life, um, I want to give us just a few uh, practices or invitations that, that could be ways I think we can, we can grow in knowing and following the light together. First, I'd say that you could read of Jesus, you know, particularly by reading of, of the story and the life and the teaching and, and the death and resurrection of Jesus as, as told throughout the gospel stories. You know, you can start with the Gospel of John, uh, where these I am statements come from that we're looking at throughout these, this series. If you were to read a chapter a day of the Gospel of John, you could start tomorrow. Uh, you'd read the whole Gospel, the story of Jesus in three weeks, you know, within the context of this series. Or what about praying to Jesus? You know, if like we celebrated Easter, Jesus is risen you know, the, the New Testament writers and authors and, and people then, sent, you know, throughout history testify to the risen spirit of Jesus being available to us, being with us, being eager to, to listen to us and to speak into our lives. As one of my favorite teachers on prayer says, it's like the, the center of prayer is getting to the place of sitting with Jesus. What if you even tried that today for a few minutes? Find a few quiet moments where you, you just express in your heart, Jesus, I want to know you. I want to see you as the light of the world, as the light of my life. Here's what I'm afraid of. Here's what I need. And then sit and listen and be attentive to the presence of Jesus and see if his light shines in some way in your heart. I also encourage you, encourage you to talk about Jesus Talk with others about Jesus. Jesus once told his followers, um, where two or three gather in his name, kind of intentionally around his presence, surely he is with them in a unique way. So ask others about what they see in Jesus, how they're seeing him as their light. Ask them how, what they think Jesus might be trying to show you as the light in your life. And talk together about how we can look at Jesus as the light and follow him. And if you don't know where to start, talk to some folks in this community. Or join one of our groups, our life groups, which are intended to be communities where we regularly talk about Jesus together. And one more for today. What if you were to serve Jesus by serving others in need? Jesus famously said that when we feed the hungry welcome the stranger, clothe the naked, care for the sick, or visit the prisoner, we actually serve him and get to know him. That we actually experience the light, maybe in the most unexpected places or seemingly darkest places. 
If we'll seek to serve humbly, generously, and sacrificially looking for Jesus there. If you're looking for a place to do that, that's what our, our missional communities of our anchor causes are all about. Friends, as we want to know and follow the God we see revealed in Jesus, the light that is Jesus. Um, I mean, as we seek to do that together, I don't know where you're feeling lost or afraid in the dark these days, but I want you to know you're not alone in this journey. Um, For me, um, I think there's actually been some ways I've been afraid of the dark recently. Um, As many of you know, uh, the season in our church Uh, has been one that's been heavy at times and kind of complicated and challenging. Um, Maybe especially for for us as a leadership and among our staff. Um, And while there's goodness at work at all times, so much of the goodness of God, you know, present among us and and through our community, um, there are also been, have been moments that have felt dark at times. Frankly, I don't think I've ever had such an extended stretch in my life where trying to see what's in front of me has been so difficult. And while, like all of us, uh, I certainly have inclinations to look at other things as the light in my life, uh, I definitely find when I try to come back to Jesus, know him as the light, Look to him as the light. Ask him to to light up my life. Listen to him and how he would guide me. I I see that the light is shining. That the light can push back darkness. It's a light that says, I am with you. A light that whispers, don't be afraid. A light that says, blessed are the peacemakers and love your enemies even though it's hard. A light that demonstrated we are here to serve and not be served, that that is where the life is. A light that says, always try to look at the plank in your own eye before even trying to see the speck in someone else's. A light that says, those who try to save their own life or be their own light um, will ultimately lose it but those who give up their life for his sake, for the sake of the true light, will ultimately find it. Will ultimately find life in him. Both new life now and even eternal life as the, Jesus as the eternal light of God. The light who has ultimately overcome all pain and sin and evil and even death so that one day all things will be made new in this light and all darkness will be banished forever in the eternal light of God who is Jesus. That's who Jesus is and that's how we can know him and know God through him today. Friends, the God we long to know by name has a name. His name is Jesus. And part of what that name means is that Jesus is the light of the world who drives out all darkness. May we come to know him in our life. May we come to know him as our light and know that we don't have to walk in darkness or fear anymore. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you um, for how you reveal who God is to us. And we thank you for your, your, your claim, your name, your revelation as being the light of the world. How desperately do we need light in our lives? So may we look to you as our light and seek to follow you as our light, trusting you as the way to life. And I just pray that right now in whatever maybe your spirit is um, nudging or prompting or encouraging on any of our hearts about, uh, about a way that we may look to you more as the light of our life, I just, I pray that we would respond to that. Um, that we would be moved by your prompting, that actually our hearts would be lit up by you today. Would you do that in our lives? And would you shine light where we need it most? We thank you. We love you. We trust you. In your name we pray, Jesus. Amen.
I worship you. You are here, working in this place. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. I worship you. I worship you. You are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. You are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who You are. You are here, touching every heart. I worship You. I worship You. You are here, healing every heart.
Thanks for joining us today. We hope that you felt inspired and challenged by our time together. Now we know that for what we've heard today to become reality in our daily lives, it's going to take more than one hour a week we spend together. It requires a moment by moment, seven days a week commitment to practicing the way of peace and the way of Jesus. That's why we provide a host of ways to continue to lean into God's presence while we're away from each other. As always, you can click the daily practices button below the player for daily spiritual exercises to continue to develop the muscles we've started building today. You can also opt into the spiritual practices notification on our app to get those helpful reminders every morning as you start your day. As our time together ends, we're going to put some questions on the screen. If you're watching with others, they can serve as great conversation starters, but they can also be a great way to process and personalize what you've heard today on your own. If you'd like a more personal conversation with somebody about anything going on in your life, we invite you to reach out to your location pastor who will follow up with you privately. Simply fill out our connect card, which you can find on our website or app. That's all for now. Thanks for joining us and have a great week.